thank God for another opportunity to study his word. It's something we should never take for granted. Amen. So many people have done so many things to preserve the word of God. Amen. For many generations. And we're thankful that we have it in many different forms and fashions. Now, the scripture on the front, that was my error. It's still Nehemiah, the second chapter. But we're actually going to go to Nehemiah, the third chapter on tonight. Nehemiah, the third chapter, starting with the first verse. Before we get there, I'm going to open this up here. We're going to talk about Nehemiah's rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem, the three pictures of workers. And we know that all of us have jobs to do. All of us have assignments. All of us have tasks that we have to adhere to in order for the church to be successful, to be effective. That's what God has called and commissioned all of us to do. And we're going to see in this chapter that people came together to do their roles, to do their part. And that's the reason why it was successful, because they had a vested interest, as we have a vested interest, for this church to be successful, for this church to be blessed, amen, for generations to be prepared to lead someday and to carry on this tradition. And we have a vested interest, and we have to kind of see ourselves in the shoes of these individuals that were working to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. One of the most honorable endeavors in all the world is that of work. The privilege of using our God-given abilities, talents, and resources for a worthwhile cause or project. In fact, our very nature craves meaning, significance, and purpose in life. Thus, if we are not actively involved in a meaningful task, project, or employment, we sense a lack of purpose and fulfillment. We, that's why a lot of people get in trouble because they are looking for a place to belong. And that's what happens with gangs. They find young men and young women who don't have certain structures at home, and they prey on that. They give them a place to belong, a place to connect, a place to feel love, although it might not be the right type of love. But people commit to those groups because they need that affirmation, and a lot of times they're not getting it from home. They're not getting it from places that they think they should get it from. And this is what the enemy does. He exploits that. And so that's why it's important that we make sure that we are a loving church, a caring church, a church that reaches out, that prays for, that shows that we are not just about Sunday, but we're here for one another throughout the week. And it takes sacrifice. It takes commitment. It takes dedication to be that type of church. But ultimately, we're working to advance God's kingdom. Amen. On the other hand, if we work hard at our jobs and are diligent in all the tasks we undertake, we fulfill what God has called us to fulfill. And we have a sense of contentment, a sense of peace, even if things are not moving the way we expect them to move or happening when we want them or expect them to happen. We still have peace knowing we're doing the will of God. Amen. This is what God would have us to do. We can't be focused on what circumstances look like or what people say. As long as we know intrinsically that we are in God's will, the work might be difficult. The work might be slow. It may be arduous and people might not applaud us for doing the work. But ultimately, God knows our hearts and God knows why he shaped us, why he molded us, why he put us here. Not on accident, but we are here on purpose. It's not by chance that any of us are a part of this church. Not by chance that any of us are alive during this era, during this time. This is God's intentionality and God's purpose to bring us together as a body of believers to have the skill sets, proclivities and propensities to do exactly what needs to be done. Amen. We have to know that God will never give us a vision if we don't have the skill sets or the abilities and spiritual gifts to accomplish it. That would be unwise and God can never be unwise. Amen. Amen. God knows what he is doing. 
When Nehemiah undertook the task of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, he needed above all else workers who would be diligent and zealously committed to the building project. A description of these workers is given in the present scripture, which we will share here briefly. They stand before us as dynamic examples of how we should work. This is Nehemiah's rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. Three pictures of diligent and zealous laborers. The workers on the north wall and its gates. The workers on the west wall. The workers on the east wall. Some were hard and diligent workers. Now, we Nehemiah 3, 1 through 12, I'm not going to ask us to read all of that, but turn to that if you have your... Bible on your mobile device or you have your Bible in your hand, whatever the case may be, turn to that. And this is what we're going to cover verses 1 through 12. Nehemiah 3 verses 1 through 12. Amen. So the workers on the north wall and its gates, some laborers worked together in a spirit of unity, but others refused to work. We're not going to, everyone's not going to do what needs to be done. That's why leadership is very important because leadership will help those who don't have a desire or don't see the reason for the work to be done on the level that it needs to be done on leadership will help people to understand the importance of doing things in the kingdom of God to the best of our abilities. Because God is the one that gave us our abilities. He's the one that gave us the opportunities that he's given us. He's the one that has increased us. He's the one that has sustained us. He's the one that has opened doors for us to be able to learn what we need to learn so that our understanding and knowledge and wisdom that we've gleaned from the world, we can bring it together together good wisdom from the world, not the bad stuff, but some of the things we've learned can be really beneficial to what we're doing in this context, in this setting, and also in our families. Amen. And so God brings all this stuff together. Amen. We ought to say, thank you, Lord. Amen. Some of those labors are dynamic examples of working together in a spirit of unity, but again, sadly, some did not. Note how both the cooperative and uncooperative spirits are emphasized in this point. The Holy Spirit could have led the writer of Nehemiah to not include those who are un uncooperative, who did not want to do the work. But God will always make sure he has enough people who, to do the work. Amen. And a lot of times the best work is done in the remnant of people, but someone's heart has to be in it. Amen. A desire, a burden. You can see the people that God will give them a burden to do the work. Amen. And they're not comfortable when they're not doing something to help advance God's kingdom. But then the people that don't have the burden, who don't have the desire, is almost like you have to give them spiritual CPR to keep resuscitating them. To, to try to help them to see and help them to do. And sometimes when you keep giving someone CPR, it'll make you tired. It'll make you feel like not doing anything because you're working so hard to try to get other people to do other things. That's what leadership is. It's hard. It's difficult, but it's worthwhile. But at the end of the day, you can't make people do anything. It's better to show them by example Cast the vision, help them to understand why they should do what needs to be done. And then they will get it and then they will have that desire and they will really enjoy the experience because they won't be forced to do it. Amen. Amen. So these individuals were not forced to do this work. They had a desire. They said, let us build. Let us arise. Let us do this together. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, that someone had to cook. Someone had to go out and hunt. Someone had to make sure that the people who were on the wall, those who are skilled in masonry work and those who are skilled in carpentry work, those who are skilled in doing all those things, they had to make sure they had the necessities, even with Nehemiah getting the letter 
from Artaxerxes to go and get all the wood from the forest. All this stuff had to be supplied. I don't care how much you want to do something. If you don't have the resources to do it, you can't get it done. Amen. Remember David. David wanted to build a temple, but but God told him no because he had shed too much blood. But did he go back and say, no, I'm not going to do anything? No, he worked diligently to raise the money and to supply the resources for the temple. So when Solomon came to build the temple, all the resources were already laid up for him. Amen. So we have to understand that some work that we start to do, amen, we won't get it done in our lifetimes. But that doesn't mean that we don't work throughout our lives so that when it's time for it to be manifested, we've done our part for the manifestation. And God is going to reward us for every jot, every tittle, every small and minute detail of our service. He will never not notice what we do. He knows it. Amen. So ultimately, our responsibility is to please God because God knows our hearts. Amen. He knows our motive. He knows our desire. He knows our drive. He knows the people who are trying to, to, to just look good for other people, trying to oppress other people. And he knows who are really trying to work to advance his kingdom. The sheep gate was on the north wall, the only section that had no natural barrier for defense, such as a hill. As a result, two lookout or defensive towers were built along the north wall the tower of the hundred and the tower of Hanel. the sheep gate was close to the temple thus it was the gate through which animals were brought to be sacrificed at the temple no doubt it was named the sheep gate because of the ceremonial flow or continual flow of animals that were headed through its entrance. So this is significant. This is important because at that time they were bringing sheep. They were bringing bullocks. They were bringing all these animals to the temple to be sacrificed for sin and trespasses. Amen. And so now this gate had been torn down so they could not function. Remember, they were trying to get back to functionality. They were trying to get back to normalcy how it was before they were exiled because of their sin amen so now God has restored them three waves of people had come back but the walls were still destroyed so they could not go back to function and have their religious practice according to the law and Judaism they could not do it because it was not conducive but God again touched Nehemiah to go back amen and and do what was necessary to put them in a position where they could serve Serve him. Amen. Serve God the way God had prescribed them to serve him. Amen. Sometimes you might not have the conducive setting to serve God. Amen. Things might not be in alignment the way you want them to be to serve God. But you have to sometimes be creative in your service of God. You have to still find a way. If things are not in alignment the way you want them to be in alignment, God will always give you a way, amen, to still serve him, to still worship him. These individuals understood the importance of making sure that things were in place so they could what please God because they had learned their lesson. Amen. They had learned their lesson. So the sheep gate reminds us of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Let's go to John 1 and 29. John 1 and 29. I'm going to ask someone to read that one for me. Just one verse. Thank you. So here it is. Now, we know that Jesus Christ was the lamb without spot nor blemish. All these lambs that were brought to the temple to be to be sacrificed were temporary. Amen. Solutions to a permanent problem. Jesus came as the lamb without spot nor blemish. The perfect lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. Amen. Coming down through 42 generations, living amongst men and women for 33 years, fulfilling the law perfectly or perfectly, 
being fully man and fully God. He was the only one that could be the offerer as the great high priest, the order of Melchizedek. As, as Hebrew says, he's the greatest and most superior high priest. But not only that, he was also the offering. Amen. He was the lamb and also the high priest at the same time. Only the high priest had the authority to, to sacrifice, to actually make the cut so the blood could be spilled amen so jesus christ subjected himself amen to being crucified for our sin and his body being broken for us and his blood being shed for us amen this is a ceremonial event on the cross that let us know that we have atonement forever where there is no shedding of blood there is no remission of sin so jesus christ fulfilled amen what needed to be fulfilled permanently he said it is finished and that meant it was finished it is still finished to this day someone ought to say thank you lord amen and so but 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 this was before jesus came amen and so what we they had to do is in order to remain close to god because what happens is when we sin we're separated from god amen when we sin, God cannot dwell in our presence. Amen. So now we need to confess our sins, ask for forgiveness, and then we need to attempt to turn with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now that that relationship or not relationship because we cannot lose our salvation, but that intimacy with God is restored. That's why confession, amen, and repentance should be your friend. You should never go through a cycle of sinning and not confess it, amen, to God and ask for forgiveness and then ask the Holy Spirit to help you to turn and to change. That's what repentance is all about. But I'm thankful for the fact that when we do that, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ is what allows the change. Amen. His blood is efficacious enough and potent enough to atone for our sins, but also to cover us even throughout our lives on into eternity. So he didn't just do one act and then leave us by ourselves. He sent the Holy Spirit, amen, to teach us all things and to bring those things to our remembrance. The Bible says he leads us into all truth. And so now he convicts us, amen, and the truth is we need to change. The truth is we need to grow. The truth is we need to be more like Christ or Christ-like. The truth is we need to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. It is the truth that will make you free because when you follow the truth you will eventually get free from being tangled up broken amen and discombobulated and something that you know your mama told you not to do and your daddy told you not to do the truth will help you to realize it takes effort it takes atonement it takes repentance to get out of anything that holds you captive and the power of the holy spirit will not only convict you but he will equip you anoint you and empower you to get loose somebody say thank you so this is what the significance of this is. The fish gate, one of the main entrances, was built by the family of Hanassah. Hesana, excuse me. Three adjoining sections were built by several families, all cooperating together to accomplish enormous, the enormous project. Note that two of the families actually built two sections, the family of Merimoth and Meshum. Perhaps these families were larger and able to provide more workers or possibly the sections of wall assigned to them were shorter, easier to reconstruct or did not involve removing much debris. Whatever the case, these families were so committed to building the project or building the wall back that they each undertook two sections of the wall. The family of Z Zadok built one section of the wall. Note the word repaired. In the original, it means to be strengthened, made strong and firm to withstand attacks. Remember in those days, the walls of the cities were there to protect them from the attack of outside forces or their enemies. So that word really means, again, to strengthen, to be made strong and firm, or to withstand attacks. The workers were not laboring half-heartedly, building with flimsy walls or materials. Rather, they were totally committed to doing their best to building the strongest wall they could. And so this is what we have to understand. 
that whatever, whatever ministry you are in, whatever office you are in, whatever your assignment is, that's your place of building or rebuilding. Building is when a new ministry is, is birthed. Now it has to be built. If you're in a ministry that has already been a long-standing ministry that needs to be rebuilt, now your job is to rebuild. And now your work is going to be evident. Whatever you're leading, whatever you are a part of, your work is going to be evident to people all around you. What is your work being, uh, how is your work looking? Where is the fruit and the evidence of your dedication and your devotion? And it does take some people People, some family, some people to do extra work to make up for the people who are not willing to do the work. And this is even the case in our church. We have some people, some families that are doing extra work because there are certain people that won't do any work. Amen. And so the people that won't do any work make the people that will work work extra because the work still has to be done. But if we all do our part now, the load can be shared. Amen. The, the load can be spread evenly. The more people you have carrying a load, the easier it is for each individual carrying that load. As soon as someone detaches themselves from carrying that load, every person that drops out, it gets heavier and heavier and more difficult. Even as the journey gets longer and people drop out, it becomes more difficult. Amen. And so this is what we have to understand. Unfortunately, not everyone was committed to the project. Some did not cooperate, even refused to take part in the rebuilding project. I found that even when the people refuse, God will still make a way. Even when people go away, God will still make a way. It's all about us being focused on God, God will always make up the difference. God will always send the right people. God will always touch the right people. God will always raise up the right people. God will always make sure because none of us, amen, are in a position, amen, where this church cannot function without us. And we have to understand that, that, that no matter what our position is, when we breathe our last breath, amen, the church will continue. I don't care how successful you were, amen. Elder Kilpatrick served this church for 45 years, was the moderator of East Florida for over 20 years, did a wonderful job. Under his leadership, this building was built. Under his leadership, the temple was built. Wonderful man, amen. But he went on to glory, and the work has to what? Continue. It has continued, amen. But he left this church in a great position, a great spot, amen. And even the past pastor, he did some things that we might not agree with, but he also did some good things too. We can never just say someone is a devil and not, not see the fact that they did some good also. Amen. And so we have to understand that every generation, amen, every, every generation, every leader in this church, they've left their mark. Deacon Green led the way of building that balcony back there deacon williams can tell you the history and deacon floyd can tell you the history of the people who have worked amen you all's father what were, were that he was committed amen over the years amen one of the top givers in the church supporting the ministry and supporting the church back in the day elder kilpatrick used to post what people gave on the wall back there he would post people who were not in good standing on the wall today amen now people are just know they're not in good standing, act like ain't nothing going on, ain't no big deal. But that, you can't do that today because of privacy laws. But that took away, amen, the incognito, amen, that took away the covering. Now you know your name going to be on the wall, so you're going to do what you, if you want to be here, you're going to do what you're supposed to do. But it shouldn't take that, should it? Amen. It shouldn't take that. But, but generations of people, Mother Daniels, amen, mother, all these different people, Mother Reigns, Mother Anthony, all these people that serve, Deacon Jen, I could just start, I could just name people, Mother Douglas, all these people that have served in this church for so many years, my grandfather, Deacon Jesse Floyd, these people have left their fingerprint on this church. Some of their names are even out there on the cornerstone of this church amen they have left their fingerprint my question is what are we going to leave 
What are we going to leave? Those walls that they built, some of them are still standing to this day in Jerusalem. These same walls, some of the same walls they rebuilt, some of them are still standing to this day. And so every time you come here, every time you do something in the church, every time you do something outside the church, if it's an initiative that God has led us to do in this church, you have to understand that you are building or you are rebuilding and what you do will echo throughout eternity. We're still talking about the people that serve on this corner since 1894 this year will be our 130th church anniversary throughout all those generations people have served faithfully they have built they have rebuilt they have rebuilt and built over and over and over again amen so this is the same concept this is a, an example amen amen we're not foreign to this we understand what this is all about it's not easy work but it's it's necessary and it's worthy work. Somebody say thank you. But not only that, but when we work like this, God will bless us as we work. Look at the example of the dedication, dedication, generational blessings. Amen. We're not just here by chance. Those people serve your father's song in the choir. Amen. He's the reason you're here. Amen. Amen. Oh, okay, I got it backwards. Well, you brought him here. Sometimes that happens. But, but, but we are here. Think about the fact that they could have chosen to go to another city. Amen. Some of them could have stayed in Tallahassee. Amen. A lot of them could have stayed in Tallahassee. Amen. But God led them here for a reason. And this is the strength of our church. It's the tradition. It, and people are so, so against tradition. Amen. Everything we knew, do now that's contemporary will someday be seen as traditional. Everything that started at some point in time, hymns were contemporary. Back in the day, they were contemporary. The songs that Mahalia Jackson was singing, those were contemporary, cutting edge at this time. And now they're seen as what? Traditional. So everything that someone comes up with, later someone's going to come up with something else. That's just how it works. So should we just ignore our traditions and walk away from them because that's not how people do it? Now, I'm not worried about how people, the problem is we are so busy sometimes worrying about what's going on around the corner, worrying about what's going on somewhere else. It's not for us to worry about what's going on somewhere else. We need to do our best to make the best of what we have here because this is where God has assigned us to be. And if we go around, woe is me and this, that, and the other, why would people want to be a part of something that we're not excited about? Amen? The fish gate was also protected by two towers. They were strategically placed to defend the north wall. It was probably named the fish gate because it was the site where the commercial marketing of the fish placed. They were they were placed in that location as they caught the fish. They came in and they sold the fish. So that's why it's called the fish gate. The fish gate is a reminder of Christ's challenge to us. Let's get Matthew 4 and 19. Amen. Thank you. So, again, he's talking to fishermen, professional fishermen. One in particular that we know is Peter. Peter had many fit or many ships. He had an he had a business, a company. He was a professional fisherman. So here is Jesus telling him, "Now I'm going to what you do well now." I'm going to use those same skills for you not to catch fish, but I'm going to use those skills 
Amen. Your ability to be creative, your ability to be to observe, your ability to study different types of fish and different places of the fish where they are at certain times of the year and what type of bait to use, what type of net to use. And, and, and I'm going to transition those skills from catching fish. So now I want you to be men washers. I want you uh, be men watchers. I want you to study and examine people. So now I'm going to allow you to use those same skills to to witness to them to to encourage them to develop them amen and we have to understand that some of the skills that we have gleaned in the world we are not to just put them on the back burner in the church now we're going to change our usage and our deployment of those gifts amen Paul tore down the church amen but when he got his call amen he began to build the church with some of those same abilities the same drive the same passion he went on missionary journeys planning churches and then he wrote epistles in response to error amen that's what the epistles are all about in response to error to make sure that those judaizers those who are coming in the back door trying to talk against grace trying to pull people back into the law he made sure that the grace of god was preeminent and people understood that you cannot live well enough to earn salvation Jesus Christ has paid it all for us anything we do for him is a bonus and a benefit because we're not working to earn salvation but I am working to earn rewards because someday he's going to reward me for my diligence amen but if I trip and fall if I stumble a little bit if I make a mistake along the way Thank God that it wasn't on me. I didn't have to do it perfectly, but now I try to get better. I try to grow, and that's what the church is all about. It's for us to be in a place where we can get the right spiritual medification, the right spiritual impartation, the right spiritual, amen, exhortation, the right spiritual guidance, amen. But not only that, we can find a place to connect because we are interdependent. We need one another. Amen. We need each other. Amen. We cannot be islands by ourselves. We are dependent upon each other. We need each other to pray for one another. Sometimes we need an encouraging word. Sometimes we need to share our testimonies. Sometimes we need to be open. You don't have to tell all of your business, but you need to let people know I've made some mistakes too. I wasn't always able to pray like I pray now. I, I wasn't always coming to church every Sunday like I come to church every Sunday now. I, I wasn't always on Bible study. I wasn't all, or I wasn't in Bible study. I wasn't in Sunday school. And I certainly was not teaching Sunday school. There was a time that I wasn't studying Sunday school. There was a time I wasn't concerned about coming to church. Yes, I had this. The Holy Spirit convicted me, but I was more focused on me than serving God. But God got my attention. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So in other words, I can't just use those ability without being under the authority of the head of the church. Because he's the one who gave me the abilities. He's the one who pre destined me amen he's the one that shaped me in my mother's womb he told jeremiah i knew you before i formed you amen amen and i formed you according to what i needed you to do he didn't say that but i'm adding to that but 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 i formed you in your mother's womb because i ordained you to be a prophet so i gave you the propensities and skill sets to be a prophet and so this is what we have to understand because if we're not careful, the enemy will exploit our gifts. Even when we try, we try to serve God. That's why you can't listen to everybody's preaching. You can't listen to everybody's teaching. You can't just allow people to pour into your life because there are some people out there who are wicked. There's some people out there that don't really believe in the Trinity. There's some people out there who are just trying to exploit people. There's some people that don't care anything about the sheep and they will say and do anything to cause the sheep to do what they want them to do. So that's why he said pastors. Amen. My job is to, to look out for the best interests of the flock. 
to, to help us to understand sound doctrine and sound teaching, to, to be an example, amen? But you're not going to get that everywhere because what you have to understand is that some people just pull up their phone and start listening to people. They haven't vetted them. They haven't looked at their background. They haven't looked at the, the, the doctrinal stance of their denomination. As a matter of fact, some are non-denominational, so you can't even find what they believe. There's no tradition. There's nothing behind them or backing them that help you to understand whether this is Protestant, whether this is Methodist or Catholic, whatever the case may be. So I don't know where this person is coming from. They believe this one day and they believe that the next day there is no anchor. There's no doctrinal anchor that will stop them from going too far to the left or too far to the right. Whatever they feel, they say it. There's some things that I will not say. I will not teach because I understand doctrine. There are some places I will never go in teaching because I know doctrine. Amen. And so we, as we listen, as we understand, now what happens, we begin to learn doctrine. It, we begin to build that, that defense system. We begin to understand we are exposed to something that is not sound. And now we begin to understand, you know what, my spirit does not agree with this. Amen. Amen. So this is what it's all about. Amen. So in building the old gate and the sections of the wall adjoining it, two great truths are seen. First, how God uses all kinds of people to get a task done. And second, how important a unified cooperative spirit is. Amen. And so that's the reason why we can't say this person will never be able to do, do this. This person will never be able to do that. Amen. Because God can use anyone that he wants to use. And God will often use people that people do not think can be used on purpose. He chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. Amen. And the Bible says he chooses the weak things oftentimes. Amen. And so it shows his power of transformation, his ability of change, the ability to change someone's trajectory and change someone's path. All of us are examples of that. Amen. And so what he does, he uses our transformation and change as an example. Amen. And then people who th who appears to be having a great time and enjoying life, they have a burden to change, a burden that they are not allowing to be on the surface, a burden that's heavy. They know they need to change. Most people who are doing wrong things, unless they are completely evil, most people who are doing wrong things, they have a conscience. They, have, they feel guilty about it, and they know that they need to change. Amen? And so now, here you are. You've been transformed. You're not perfect, but they see something different about you. As a matter of fact, they used to know you, the old you. And now it's like you don't see them for 20 years and all of a sudden, amen, they have a point of reference for you and all of a sudden they see you again and they wonder, who are you? God can change you so comprehensively that the people who used to run with you, who used to know you, don't even recognize you. Same stature. Same voice, but different spirit. Because it is our soul. That's who we really are. The seat of our volition, our intellect, amen, our emotions. And so the Holy Spirit connects with our human spirit and begins to send intel and shapes and molds our souls. That's who we are. That's why the Bible says, wise is the man who wins a soul. Because it's not about this. It's not. Because this is going to get old someday. This is going to die someday. But my soul is designed to live forever. So what's most important to God is the place of my soul. That's who I am. Amen? So when we are changed, when the Holy Spirit has done his work, he's convicted us. He keeps convicting us and convicting us. He keeps whipping on us. Ultimately, we're going to allow that whipping and conviction to shape us and mold us and ultimately change our walk and change our talk because the only way I can talk the wrong way, the only way I can walk the wrong way if it's my heart is in the wrong place. So this is how this thing happens. 
So this is what we have to understand. God wants to put your transformation on display. And that's why people will watch you and find any error in you and call you out on your error because they think and they know you love God. And so now when you make a mistake, it takes them off the hook. I knew it wasn't real. They will pounce on the opportunity to highlight your defunction, your deficiency. But they don't understand that God is still working on that. God is still helping you to develop in that area. It's his grace. His grace is sufficient. But they don't want to hear that. They see one error and they'll pounce on it and highlight it and say, I knew God wasn't real. I knew Christianity wasn't real. Why would I spend my time trying to change when what God is doing in your life has not changed you? So this is why we have to be careful what we do in the public. If we really want to be serious about this thing now, if we really want to be committed now, if you don't want to be serious and you don't want to be committed, I'm not talking to you. But if you really want to be serious, if you really want to let your light so shine before men, if you really want to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow Jesus. And when you follow Jesus, he'll make you fishers of men. If you really want to be serious about this thing, you have to be careful what you do in public. Because this is the reason in a lot of cases that we are raising up spiritual midgets. Because people see us in the church and they see us out of the church and they follow what they see out of the church, not what they see in the church. Because it's easier to follow what's outside the church because my flesh already agree with what I see outside the church. My flesh don't agree with that. So now I'm going to take the easiest path and follow what I see outside the church because I don't want to be in the church anyway. So if we're going to rise, raise up the next generation... If we're going to be a church that's on fire for the Lord, that's serious about making disciples, that's serious about being an example, that's serious about helping the young people to understand the importance of serving God, living a life that's pleasing to God, not because you want God to give you a house, not because you want God to give you a car, not because you want God to give. If God does nothing else for me, he's done enough. He saved my soul. And I mean that with all sincerity. I served God when I was 16 when I didn't have nothing in this church. Before that, I served him at First Providence. I was blessed to have a nice family. Amen. Blessed to be able to date Monique at that time, now Dr. Floyd. We used to sit here on Wednesday night, right here in this church, week in and week out. I was learning, listening, growing. Who would have thought I would become a minister and receive my call while I'm playing in the National Football League. Amen. Even my wife said, you done lost your mind. She did. Oh, you said, have you lost your mind? Yeah, that's what you said. It was something like that. But, but God, yes, I did. I lost my mind. I put on the mind of Christ. See, I had my plans. I had my plans, but God had different plans. Amen. And so, so, so I have embraced God's plans for my life. Amen. It's taken a whole lot of sacrifice, whole lot of dedication, whole lot of devotion. Amen. Amen. I left a lot of things on the table, a lot of money on the table, a whole lot of money on the table. But the love of money is the root of all evil. That's why when you know God has called you, you can leave millions on the table and do what God told you to do. People might say, well, what do you mean millions? I was in the National Football League. They make millions. A scout, right. So... We have to understand that this is what's required. God will sometimes challenge us to change our lives and go in a totally different direction. And it will take great sacrifice. I'm not doing this to, to talk about me or make myself be on a platform out to be an example. We give God the glory. Where God guides, he provides. 
And if I had to do it again, I would do it again. The old gate was built by the families of two men, Yoda and Muslim. Meshulam. Amen. The gate was also known as the Jessaniah Gate, which referred to the city to which the road led, the city that lay on the border between Judah and Samaria. It was also known as the Mishnah Gate, which referred to the second district of Jerusalem lying on the western wall or hill. People from Gibeon and Mizpah also helped in the project building the next section. Their cooperation and commitment to the project is significant. For these two cities were under the authority of the governor of Trans-Euphrates. This means that the governor himself supported the project. Business leaders and tradesmen also supported the project, building the next section. One of the business, business leaders was a goldsmith named Uzael. And the other was a perfume maker named Hananiah. These two business leaders undertook the construction as far as the broad wall. So these are people who are outsiders, business leaders that, that chipped in. And, and these things have happened with us in our attempt to build on Georgia Street. People have given, given large sums to our building fund, Miss Harriet on the east side gave $5,000 at one time. And she's going to get her five names on the wall because that's what we promised. Amen? And all the people that have gone on the glory that gave, they're going to get their names on the wall. Amen? And so we have to understand that, that God will touch other people's hearts to help us, amen, but it's the right people. He's done that, and he will continue to do that. That's why we do all we can. We trust him to do what we cannot do. He's the one that will make up the difference. Obviously, they needed these business leaders because they didn't have enough within the camp. So God touched their hearts, and as I said, God will give people a burden, amen, that's just as powerful and heavy, amen, as you have. He'll give them a burden to help you that's just as powerful pronounced as your burden is to receive the help and God will bring those burdens together they will collide and you'll have a destiny moment that will change your life forever will bless what you're trying to do help produce the vision but also the person that bless you God will bless them too God does things like that amen even the political leaders became involved in the building project the chief ruler of a half district of Jerusalem repaired the section adjoining the work of the two businessmen. People who had houses sitting next to the wall also joined the project. This suggests the importance of neighbors cooperating together and looking out for and taking care of the neighborhood. The next section of a tower, the tower of the ovens, were built by two men. Malija, Malija, and Hasab. The other ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, Shalom, built the next section of wall. Significantly, his daughters jumped in and helped him in the construction, which indicates that both sexes were involved in the project. Men and women were working together in the church men and women worked together it was a beautiful thing on sunday how mother harris got in and led a song uh, during the devotion amen deacon floyd came off the door and led devotion amen at the end of the service we had mother uh, diana jones johnson leading a song amen we had the choir of course and deacon s Maya, all them song but it was a beautiful thing to see the men the deacons and also mother harris working together and it was a beautiful devotion amen there are so many things that we do together amen and we have to understand that mothers and deaconess are responsible also for the young women in the church amen 
you have a responsibility to reach out and to check on them amen to to pray for them to encourage them amen in their attempt some of them are raising children by themselves encourage them amen help them to understand that you are there for them you love them amen that if they ever need to call you and talk to you that you are there for them but don't just say it and not do it this is how we build a church and rebuild a church we have to be willing to do what our discipline says we are to do deacons are to maintain the unity amen anytime someone starts talking foolish and starts doing something that they're not supposed to do deacons are supposed to maintain the unity amen amen take care of fires put fires out before they begin to take over amen and burn the house down we rebuke that in the name of Jesus Christ but but we have to be willing to maintain the unity amen amongst all other responsibilities amen that we have in our offices but how do we know what to do if we don't know what the discipline says and what our responsibilities are amen that's what ordination is all about learning your role learning how the church functions amen learning how you fit within that 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 process amen learning what your role is what your place is amen and so now when we all understand what our responsibilities are we got the deacons building over here we got the mother's building we got the deaconess building we got the leaders of all the auxiliaries and ministries building we got the choir members building and and rebuilding we are all working together me as your pastor you are following me as I follow Jesus Christ we are all on the same page and on one accord and we are building together and we are rebuilding together I said building together because there are some ministries that are being birthed the widow's ministry has been birthed and is doing a miraculous job mother mother dr. Sheila Jones she's leading now the the single saved and satisfied ministry they had a powerful conference call on last week uh, that's mother um, Washington who's leading the widows ministry so we have ministries that are being birthed and being built but these ministries are making a difference we have sister Sinquise and and brother Deshaun who's leading the lit ministry now we got young people on fire for the Lord even in Sunday school some of the comments that they're making we have things that are being built and rebuilt the lit ministry was birthed so it's being built amen and so we have to understand that we have to take our part seriously. You have to care about your ministry. You have to care about your auxiliary. You have to care about that. And if we all care about what we're supposed to care about, everything will be taken care of. You have to care before you take care of. Amen. Because if you don't care, you won't do the necessary work to do what's necessary to press through and make sure that this church is viable this church is growing amen this church is doing and the deacons are in charge of the gold ministry i know they're gonna get it together and have one event amen before the quarter is over an outreach event because they're in charge of the gold ministry amen I know they're going to get out there and we're going to talk about it and we're going to witness to some people and be fishers of men and we're going to encourage people. We're going to reach out to our community because if we just look inward and not outward, we have a dead church. Church that's alive, amen, will continuously grow. And if we don't reach out, they won't come in. Amen. So it's important that we all do our part and build the way we're supposed to build. But we are doing that and we will continue to do that. The fact to note are that everyone was assigned very specific tasks and that everyone cooperated together in a unified effort. Each person kept his or her eyes on the specific task and worked to accomplish the project. Each used the specific gift God had given them. Throughout chapter 38, workers and 42 different groups are named, all cooperating and working together to build their city and its walls. Practically everyone was taking part in the project, the school. Dr. Floyd has done an outstanding job with the school. Dr. Jones has done an outstanding job with the school. Deaconess 
Maya has done a great job helping with the school. Miss Duncan has done a great job. She's well, she was there helping with the school. Miss Battle done a great job helping with the school. That's being built. So we are building and rebuilding at the same time. Amen. All the people that have come and prayed for the school and supported the school, people from the community, amen, have, have, have come together and we are building and rebuilding together. Amen. This is the work that God has assigned to us as a church, and we are doing it. Amen. But I want to tell you that everyone's not happy when we do the work of ministry. Every and the Williams mother and Deacon Williams, the job they've done to keep it impeccably clean and beautiful. And Deacon even said, I'm sorry for, for taking some off your honey do list when he put that little thing together I was supposed to put together I said that's all right I appreciate you deep amen amen but 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 see this is everyone's not happy with what's going on at Burkett Chapel and I believe that there are some pastors that are literally amen trying to coerce people to leave our church and join their church I would never do that I would never do that there are some people recruiting people from our church So everyone's not happy. But our job is to go out to the unchurched. To compel them to come. So when we lift Jesus up, he'll draw all men unto himself. Amen. This is what it's all about. 728. All right. So political leaders, priests, common people, both men and women, business leaders and craftsmen. Cooperation is an absolute essential in achieving any task that requires more than one person. Oneness of spirit is a must. Unless there is unity, people are moving in different directions, pulling against each other and accomplishing little. The result of pulling against each other is dissension and divisiveness. Think how often dissension and divisiveness rip apart families, friends, workers, classmates, athletes, businesses, social organizations, churches, communities, political parties, nations, and a host of other relationships. For these reasons, for these reasons, and so many more, success in maintaining order and achieving goals is largely dependent upon the harmony of the participation of the people involved in the mission so we need to protect that at all costs amen amen we need to protect that at all costs because God has put things in place for us to do everything he has called us to do the infrastructure is there now all we're waiting on is God's timing amen everything God told me and I told y'all it's gonna come to pass amen amen in the name of Jesus Christ and we thank God for the sacrifice that just happened Brother Robert Earl and Sister Vicki Jones, 5000 to the building fund and 5000 to the school. Amen. This is an example of how God would touch people's hearts. And when people believe in what you are doing, it's easier for them, amen, to do those type of things in a sacrificial way. Amen. That's the evidence that God is with us. What a blessing. Amen. Amen. Are we ready for the report, Deke? Amen. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Thank you, sir. All right. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, honey. Good to see you. I know you're tired. Amen. 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 I'll take Mimi home tonight. You can go and get you some rest. Love you. Let us close out. Anyone else have anything else? All right. Let's close out. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. We thank you for, for this day. We thank you for the vision that you've given us. We thank you for the example you've given us with how they work together to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Lord, we are building and we are rebuilding at the same time. Help us to understand what we have here, how special it is, how privileged we all are to be here. We are blessed, dear Lord. But the church can only be as successful as we follow you. And as we stay together and we're on one mind, on one accord, focusing on the vision that you've given us. 
We ask that you will bless those who are sick and shut in. I pray that you will touch my mom and heal her, dear Lord. I pray that you will touch also Dr. Jones if she's not feeling well. Bless her to feel better on this side. All of our members who are sick and shut in, I pray that you will touch all of them, dear Lord. Lord, we don't have to send you anywhere because you're everywhere at the same time. We trust you for your blessing, Father. Keep us, Father. Add to our church, dear Lord. Send them from the north, south, east, and west. But, Lord, I pray that we will do our part in that process. We thank you once again, Lord. The grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be with you all. And all of God's people say, amen. Love you all. God bless you all.